Hi, let's talk about development processes for a while. Development processes can roughly be divided in a sort of timeline, starting with the old waterfall model, going through iterative incremental models, uh, rational unified process being one of the uh, those. Scrum from the Agile uh, movement is one more iterative incremental uh, development process. And the extreme case where you have extreme iterations and extreme incremental uh, development is uh, the lean movement and Kanban is one of those. So let's go through each of these in slightly more detail. The waterfall model uh, was created in 1970 in a paper by uh, Royce uh, and the idea that he presented was that you do requirements engineering and once you're done with requirements engineering you throw that over the fence to analysis which then does analysis obviously and once it's done with that you throw it over to design implementation testing and then you release it and go into a maintenance mode there is forward movement only in this that you do one thing first and then you're done with it you make it make sure that you're perfect with your requirements before you throw it over to the analysis phase now on page two of his article he says that this won't work in practice you need to go back. So once you've done a bit of analysis, you will realize that your requirements needs more elaboration. So you go back and do more requirements engineering. Same thing in design. You will probably, once you've started doing design, realize that, yeah, we need to analyze this slightly better. Or we need to go back and do more requirements engineering. So you go back and do more requirements engineering, and then you go forward through analysis and design again. Um, so in this paper, we actually draws more and more errors going uh, backwards through the process as well as forward through the process. Um, but the takeaway that people got from this paper was this very simple waterfall model and that's shaped a lot of uh, ideas about how software development should be done. Much later we have, uh, I think it was Barry Bone. Uh, who talked about iterative development and the idea is just what actually Roy said that you do it in iterations you go round and round and round you do some requirements you do some analysis design implementation testing you evaluate what went well what didn't go well and then you plan for the next iteration and one release of a product might cons contain several of these iterations, or more than several iterations, before you actually de deploy your product. And then you go back, start planning your next release, do a number of iterations before you deploy. This is incremental, that you uh, build upon what you already have, you have some requirements and you build upon them, uh, upon them to make more elaborate requirements. You, have, you already have implementation from your previous iteration and you add to that. You add more classes, you add more methods to the classes, you add more uh, attributes to the classes. So you add more functionality to the system for each iteration. The idea, you can say, is that you start with a minimum viable product, uh, um, whatever that means, and that might actually mean that you have to build the product in several iterations in and of itself. Uh, so a couple of iterations in order to get to a point where you have a minimum viable product. Um, you start with some sort of overview, so you test the edges of the system in a, in a sense. You get one flow through the system. That's the idea of a minimum viable product. Viable product. Uh, and then you add, uh, add details for each iteration, more features, more functionality. And at the end of each iteration, you have an execut executable product. It's not complete. It doesn't uh, support all the features that uh, or all the requirements yet, but it's something that can be used as it is. Inside of each, each iteration, you are essentially doing a mini waterfall, but because you've shortened the development cycle, so a waterfall project might span two years, uh, and here, and one iteration should preferably be shorter, uh, a couple of months, and the more uh, 
the shorter iterations you get, the more agile you are because you can easily throw away what you've done and uh, restart one iteration or you can uh, you get feedback early from your customers. The benefits of having this iterative development is that you at the end of each iteration you have something to deliver and with short iterations you can always deliver something. You get feedback earlier uh, so once you have an iteration done you can deliver that you can start getting feedback you learn what was good what wasn't good uh, and then you can modify your uh, product accordingly. The idea with doing a minimum viable product is that you identify challenges, for example, with testing, deployment, development, whatever, uh, and you do this fairly early, so you have more time to fix it. Uh, if you go to a waterfall product, uh, well, in theory, once you've done the requirements, you should be able to start with the testing in some sense and start preparing for the testing. In practice, however, you probably do that at the end of the implementation phase. And with an iterative development, because you are getting something out fairly quickly, this minimum viable product or some, some, something which might be smaller than that, but might also eventually be, get bigger than a minimum viable product, you realize early on that you need perhaps a specific test framework. All right, so let's get that. So maybe you don't have that in place for the first iteration, but for the second iteration, you definitely have that. Now, in a waterfall product, that means that for release two, which is four years ahead of the, uh, in the future, you have your test framework ready, which is very long time to wait for a test framework. So with iterative development, you test things earlier, you get feedback from customers, you get feedback from uh, your own development organization about what works and what doesn't work. So that's the benefit. Scrum is one iterative incremental development method. It comes from the Agile community and essentially it provides a framework around iterative development. They say things about the size of an iteration, for example, should be less than two, three weeks. They call them sprints. Um, they limit the size of the teams because if you're going to keep these small iterations, you can't have too many people involved because it's going to be uh, too much overhead and too much management. So relatively small teams. You may have many small teams. You may have hundreds of small teams, but each team isn't that big. They also go in and um, nitpick a bit about how you organize the team. It shouldn't be some uh, management structure that dictates how you should have your team organized. It should be self-organizing, meaning that if you need a particular role for a particular sprint, you make sure that you get that within the, within the team itself. Uh, there's no appointed project manager or team sprint manager. There's scrum masters and there's product managers and all sorts of things outside the sprint, but inside the sprint, there's no supporting structure like that. Uh, you Instead, you invent roles that you need. You have the list of requirements. They call it a backlog, um, which is basically a prioritized list of the requirements to implement. They call these requirements user stories. User stories are not use cases. We will talk a lot about use cases in this course, but user stories are not the same thing. Let's be very clear about that. The idea is that for every new sprint, you reprioritize, or rather for every new requirement you get, you make sure that you put that into the right place, into a prioritized place in uh, the backlog. And then you pick from this, from the top of this backlog, for your particular sprint and decide that these are the requirements we're going to be implementing in this particular sprint. Um, around the sprint you have a planning event at the beginning where you basically talk, you uh, communicate this is what we're supposed to be doing during the sprint to be in line with uh, product strategies, corporate strategies, whatever. You select your stories from the product backlog, you prepare a sprint backlog, you decompose uh, whatever needs to be decomposed, because some of the stories that you have in the product backlog might be really big, such uh, so-called epics, and they are actually they they actually need to be broken down into smaller uh, user stories before you can start working on them. You make a commitment as a team that we are going to deliver the following user stories. 
during the scrum or during the sprint you have daily scrum meetings which in uh, extreme programming terms is the uh, daily stand-up meeting they should be relatively short with a rel relatively small agenda what we do so each person in the team will tell this is what i did yesterday this is what i'm working on right now and this is what's stopping me from doing my job right now I might not have access to the testing framework. I've got stuck in this algorithm. I can't solve it. And then the idea is not to resolve these problems during the scrum, but to get an overview of them and then start resolving them after the stand-up meeting. After the sprint, you have a review meeting to, to get an overview. What did we complete? What didn't we complete? Um, demo to the stakeholders so that they see what you've done and they get, uh, they're able to give you feedback there and then and a retrospective what went well what went wrong and how can we improve the development putting all of this into a picture here you have the product backlog so if you get a new requirement the first thing you do is that you put it in to one specific place into this it might be uh, here it might be a low uh, priority requirement and it ends up at the bottom um, from this during the sprint planning you pick probably the top items or items that belong to a particular uh, user story or uh, a theme of some sort into the sprint backlog which is basically again a prioritized list of requirements and then you do the sprint two to three weeks uh, implement those ba uh, items that you picked from the backlog uh, and release something uh, at the end of the sprint you do the review show it to the customer and everything and then you do the retrospective the scrum master who's standing here in the middle his job is to make sure that the scrum and the sprint works well his involvement shouldn't be in the product because you have somewhere let's see where he is uh, the product owner that's his job see he's here uh, as well he takes care that you're doing the right thing the scrum master is more or less there to see that make sure that well the process flows uh the sprint works uh you 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 haven't choked on too many items you haven't choked on uh the, the, just the development process kanban is taking it to the next level it's if you have really quickly shifting priorities you don't even so you can't have a prioritized backlog because the priorities change on a daily basis for example uh, so whatever you picked at the beginning of a sprint is out of date uh, or not prioritized in the same way uh, halfway through the sprint even if it's only two three weeks um, they say that it's less upfront planning i don't know about that because there's a lot of setup going on before you can uh, uh, get to kanban um, there's no fixed length iterations in that sense. You don't have these two, three week sprints and, and a regular release cycle. Uh, what you do instead is that you measure the lead time and the velocity. Um, velocity meaning how, how many uh, stories are able to push through this process per time unit. Um, <clears throat> three pillars of Kanban is that you visualize the workflow so that everyone can see what is going on right now where are we what uh, is there are things moving along uh, you limit work in progress uh, so you intentionally put in what essentially is bottlenecks into the process um, and this is done so that uh, um, each team member is working on uh, say one particular item and when they come to a point where they can't push it to the next uh, phase because there are too many work in progress in next, the next phase, well, the entire process is essentially stuck there. So th that means that this team member has to go over to the next phase, clear the bottleneck um, so that there's I space left for whatever work he's doing so he can push it on to the next level. I think this would be better if I show a picture first right here. You have the backlog, 
Kanban, these Kanban boards, by the way, are uh, often presented on a whiteboard uh, or something like that in the development room. So you can uh, always see what's going on, who's working where. You have the persons working and what they're doing. Um, you can see that each of these uh, little post-it notes is one uh, user story, and it should be going forward through the, the process. You should have a flow here going on like that. You have your backlog, you've selected uh, for implementation, here's the work in progress, you can only select two before you have to start working on them. Alright, that means that you can't select items, too many items that are going to be reprioritized and down-prioritized, you can only pick two at a time, and then you have to start working on them. <coughs> Sorry. So, during in the development phases, you can have uh, three items going on, you have ongoing people that uh, these are being developed, and you, in this case, you have one that is actually done. What needs to be done with this done item is that you need to push it over to the next stage, which is deploy. And here we see the bottleneck because there is already one working uh, or one item in the deployment stage. Um, so this work in progress is full. So if this guy is finished with his uh, uh, item, and tries to push it over here, it can push it to the done stage. That's okay, because it's still just three items in the development phase. But it can't push it over to the deployment phase, because there's already one item there. That means that he has to either go over and help these guys to get this one uh, through deployment, so that they can push his item over here. Or, he'll have to go back, pick another one here, but he can't do that, because the development process is full with uh, uh, three items, which is the maximum work in progress. So his only option is actually to go forward and help these. Um, that means that you have a very easy control measure of that way you can guide working efforts to where they're needed, but you don't have to have a manager going on, going in there and saying, ah, you should be doing deployment now because we need you there. This person dis discovers that by himself. When he gets there, that, yeah, I need to work on deployment because there's only one work in progress allowed there, and it's already full. Let's see. Next, and the last pillar is that you measure lead time, so that you're always keeping tabs of how good you are. Are you developing at the pace that uh, you uh, normally do? If you're developing at a slower pace, this is not something that can be dictated from the uh, management side, uh, mind you. Uh, this is something that you develop over a knowledge of uh, over time, that this particular team works in a particular velocity. And if you de develop slower than that, well, something is going on that you need to keep tabs on. What is going on that makes you slower right now? Or if you develop faster, well, are you cutting corners? What's happening? And that also means that if you know your velocity, you also know, in some sense, how much work you can take on, because you know how quickly you can deliver it. So you have a visible flow, you have visible bottlenecks, and you have more responsibility to the individual team members, um, as I explained. So, that's Kanban for you. Um, connecting back to the unified process, uh, it's more in line with the Scrum, um, but it's not saying that you, you must do it like this. Uh, but the way that most unified process books are uh, written, they sort of assume that you have these uh, fixed iterations and you do iterations and you deliver something. Whereas Kanban is not... Um, dictating these fixed iterations, so that's why you end up uh, describing it as closer to Scrum. Okay, thank you for this. Let's see you in the lecture, and um, let's discuss this more there.